It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. Ian Thompson from the Register. Serenity Caldwell from iMore. Matthew Ingram from Fortune. We're going to talk about all the announcements Google made at I.O., what Apple might talk about at WWDC, and the lady who brought in an Apple One computer for recycling. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 512, recorded Sunday, May 31st, 2015. The Wombat Test. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you get award-winning financial tools, unbiased advice, and a transparent view of all your investments. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, or other Apple product is worth at gazelle.com. And by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. And you can connect Dropbox for Business with over 300,000 apps for project management. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. And by Little Bits. The easy way to build electronics with modular building blocks. Go to littlebits.com slash twit and you'll receive $20 off your first kit, plus free shipping in the U.S. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Proudly live and in living color, Ian Thompson is here from the Register. Good to see you. Good to see you, too, there. Uh, I should warn you that uh, he just tweeted on another This Week in Tech show. We'll try to keep it clean. <laughs> But after a tough week, dot, dot, dot. Well, Has it know, been a tough week for you? You weren't at Google, uh, Google I.O., were you? No. It was a tough week. All it right. It really was a tough week. Oh, good. That and a bunch of other stuff. And it was, yeah, would have, Saturday morning, it was just like, right, turned all the alarms off. Uh, I'm going to sleep in till 11 o'clock. And then at 8.30, rolled over into a puddle of cat vomit. So, yeah, oh, that is a tough it? week. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a scar. We have kittens. I have a scar on my back. You can't get sick from a kitty scratch, can you? I uh, wouldn't have thought so. It's not so. like something called cat scratch fever or anything, is there? There is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you start biting during the show, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> also with us from uh, Fortune, I'm happy to say, formerly of Giga Ohm, the famous Matthew Ingram from, uh, you know, during the week you join us in your office, but today you're relaxed. <laughs> yeah, I'm at a friend's house, actually. Very nice. That looks very comfy. It I, is. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. I really appreciate that. Serenity Caldwell is stuck in traffic, but she'll be with us. Uh, she's in Boston, so stuck in traffic in Boston means she could be with us sometime in the next few weeks. <laughs> but we'll, we'll think, I'll let you know. I'll keep my eyes posted. We'll, we'll get her here yep. in, in a bit. You know, if you think you had a bad week, i got to think the product manager for Apple's Photos app had uh, a bad week. Well, and everyone at Flickr as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's um, yeah. They, I kind of got the feeling Google oversold the photo thing, but it's certainly really interesting what they're doing with it. I don't know if they oversold it. Have you played with it? Uh, I have played with it, and then I took it immediately off my phone once I read the terms and conditions. Oh, so. terms, schmerms. <laughs> what do they say? They own all our pictures. Yep. Oh, much. Who cares? That's pretty standard, though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I know it's ass covering, but at the same time, it's just like right. I'm going to test this out in the office privately with a couple of photos I really couldn't give a monkey's about. So it's. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. It looks better than what Apple's got at the moment, certainly. And it's um, ironic it's the same name as what Apple Yeah, has. well, there's only so many things you can call pictures of people, so, you right. know, I guess they're all going to use it. Can't, um, can't, you know, can't trademark Apple, the word. Apple only has themselves to blame, let's face it. I mean, this is a company with $800 billion or something, and they haven't been able to figure out how to get a cloud service That's working true. properly. Mm -hmm. Their photo... Their photo thing has gone through multiple revisions, and it's like punching yourself in the face repeatedly every time you try to use it. It just makes me want to throw my computer out the window. I, uh, unlike you, Ian, uploaded every photo I've ever taken to this. Me too. Uh, I have well over uh, 39,000 photos on here now, and the categorization alone makes that worthwhile. 
So it did. Facial it, recognition it, is amazing. It did this. Yeah. It did this all. Here's my son, Henry. Uh, it, it did. I didn't. I didn't. Maybe I'll. I'll choose me instead. That's Good probably boy, well, with your way. kids. Thank did you. It track them from childhood to adulthood with any with, a, with any mistake. Uh, that's an interesting question because I know Henry's here both as a child and ah. as a twenty year old. Uh, but Abby is not here both as a child and 20-year-old, and I have plenty of pictures of both. Yeah. So, uh, I, th I and then it's places, mm -hmm. and then it's things, including cars, skylines, stadiums. Let's just see. Cats. Hmm. How 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 many cat pictures? Lots of cat pictures. You do like your cats, don't well, you? Well, they're new, and of course, you know, the new, the new thing gets all the pictures. Dogs, there were a few errors. It uh, categorized... Uh, uh, some cats as dogs. They <laughs> categorized some stone lions as dogs. Uh, but it's, pr I mean, this, I didn't do anything. This, mm -hmm. I uploaded well, these pictures. Well, lions stoned, but no. there's, a, there's a stone lion that thinks is a cat, oh, a dog. Stone. Like a dog. I think you said stone, Not stone lions. Stone. Like, stone. What are you doing to these creatures? But, and there's three cat pictures that it thought were dogs. But, you know, Flickr's doing this too, right? Yeah. And obviously, there was some massive breakthrough in artificial uh, intelligence and image recognition in the last few years, because it seems like everybody does this now. But it's still incredibly useful that I that is not a, that is not a dog that is a lion shaped cat. Uh, but yeah, but still, it's it is kind of amazing um, that they could go through f almost forty thousand pictures of mine. Mm -hmm. In less than a day, fully categorize them without any intervention on my part. And they've actually been doing this for a while. I know Flickr just came out with it recently, but I've had 50,000, 60,000 photos at Google Plus Photos, which is basically the same thing. And once I turned on Google's personal search, I could go to a Google search box and type in my photos of Caitlin, our oldest daughter, and it would pull up every photo I've ever taken. It's really amazing. I just typed in a search for Paris in the snow, and uh, let's see if it finds anything. I know I have pictures of Paris, and yes, it's snowy. You don't find that mind-boggling? No, no, I do. <laughs> I think it's great. I just don't have that many photos that I want to put in the cloud. Um, call me Mr. I have Paranoid. Them all there. I have them all there. Yeah, I did. Uh, to me... The, what is Google going to do? Sell my? You think, I mean, what do you what do you think they're going to do? Sell no, my? No, I just I don't see any particular point to it. I back all my photos up onto a hard drive right. once a month. I put them onto another hard drive and take that into work. So I've got dual backups on two, in two locations, and I leave it at that. I don't really access that many photos unless I know I'm going to look for, go and need something specific. So as long as I've got copies at home and work, then you know I, I'm not really sold yeah. on sticking on the cloud. I'm glad. Uh, I'm really glad that I had. Uh, Google Plus auto photo backup turned on. So every photo I take on my phone automatically gets uploaded because of my backpack got stolen when we were in Italy. Uh -huh. ah. So my laptop, iPad, um, and an external hard drive with every photo I've ever taken. So someone in Italy has all my photos. <laughs> I'd much rather Google had them. Um, but so now I didn't have to worry about not having a laptop because all the photos that I own exists you know, on Google servers, I can reach them wherever, as long as I have an internet connection. Yeah, I think that theft is where I'm going to come a cropper with my approach because it, you know all, it's all well and good, but if somebody does half inch your backpack and runs off with it, you are a little bit stuffed. That's a good, that's a good example of how it works well. But um, yeah, in Italy as well, it happens an awful lot. We just came back from there last summer, and an awful lot of people lost their bags. We were talking yeah. to Trey Ratcliffe yesterday. He had exactly the same thing happen. But As he had you a ton of hardware. He had Leica lenses, yeah. Sony cameras. Oh, he that's lost. Terrible. Well, you know, I Trey is like a Buddhist or something because he just said, "Well, <laughs> it just happens, and that's life. It's the photo tax. I just bought new gear, and he just I would have been." I was going to say, I want that head on a <laughs> spike outside the house <laughs> yeah. now. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, the the cloud certainly made a big difference for us because. Like five, six years ago, everything I owned would have been on that computer, That's right. including all my photos. That's right. And I would have been heartbroken, you know, all these pictures of my kids and stuff. But as it was, now I just get to upgrade my laptop. I couldn't care less. <laughs> is there a, uh, what is going on with cloud storage prices? Is, I, I, you know, for Google to offer this base, I mean, okay, it's probably less than a terabyte. Unlimited is probably less than a terabyte in 99% of the cases. But yeah. still, offering millions of people a terabyte of storage for free is not insignificant. How can they do this? 
But I think they must know that most people aren't going to use that much, right? right. Most mm -hmm. people are going to put up a bunch of recent photos, maybe some old, you know, keepsakes, but they're not going to be like us. They're not going to upload 75 gigabytes of photos, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, there are limits as well in that you've, you know, maximum 16 megapixel for images. Right. Maximum right. 1080p for, for, for video. Videos. And then when they put them on there, they compress them they compress them down and muck about with them. Yeah. So you can't stick raw files up on there. You can't stick... You can, files. but you'll pay for it. It's well, not if you yeah, pay yeah. 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 I mean, once your yeah. Google Drive allowance has gone up, then yeah, it's $10 a month. I have a terabyte on Google Drive, so... Because uh, I... Cause you I pixel. do, too. Yeah, because of the pixel. Yeah. So um, I get like 1.3. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a cloud backup... Uh, I'm, I'm sort of platform agnostic. Okay, go ahead. Or, you use the word slut. You know you want to. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or I'm I'm obsessed with redundancy, so yeah. I actually pay Amazon. Yeah. And Dropbox and Google. Me and too. I have a terabyte. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft offers unlimited storage if you're a uh, Office 365 subscriber. So I have that. Facebook will uh, take every picture. Mm -hmm. I admittedly yeah. crushed. Yeah. You know, into nothingness, but they'll do it. Uh, there's no use. There's no reason to lose a picture ever again. Let's put it. No. That, let's say that. No. Uh, and the thing that the, the thing that's great about Google Photos is, so I've got like you, I've got, you know, fifty thousand, sixty thousand photos, but I, I don't have time to tag all those them. photos. Yeah. Right? And you can't find the one you want, or you can't. You remember? Oh yeah, it was a photo of so and so, or maybe it was in Paris, or maybe like at least this gives you the ability to kind of go through them without taking hours to try and find a single photo or tag a photo. I just typed Australia. Now, normally I would go into Lightroom. I would go through all the photos. I would tag them, right. create a collection. I didn't have to do any of that. Here's all the photos I took in Australia, you know? Um, by the way, what kind? what is that animal? What do you call that? <laughs> I think koala? that's a... Wombat? Is it a wombat? It, I think it's a wombat. I think it's a wombat. All right, here's a test. Wombat. <laughs> we know there's a wombat picture in here Does somewhere. It passed the wombat. Oh my oh, god, they found it. Did. It passed the wombat test. <laughs> it passed the wombat. No, I did not expect that. No way. There's the name of the show right there. <laughs> wombat test. Spot on. That is pretty. Now, there's more than one wombat picture. It didn't get them all. So, yeah. it's only a, you know, kind of a moderate wombat test. Uh, pass, you know, it's because there's another wombat, but that's a wombat from behind. Yeah. So you can't expect it to really it didn't know. Pass that's the wombat's just, behind. That could pass. just be, yeah. It could wombat. just be a ball of fur. Yeah. But it got the big one. Wow. Plus, and, you didn't say wombat behind. You just said wombat. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> wait a minute. You really? Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I'm not going to say wombat behind, but let's try Tasmanian Devil. Do you think it'll recognize that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if it did wombat. Tasmanian devil from behind. Oh, no. oh, did I spell what? Tasmanian wrong? I did. Ah. Got to spell it right. Google's... No. Uh-oh. No. So uh, it, it did pass the wombat test, but it failed the Tasmanian devil test. So hang on. You went all the way to Australia and you didn't get a picture of a drop bear. What is going on? What is a drop bear? Drop bears, that terrible beast. They drop out the trees and attack you. You can only deal what? with them by smearing Marmite on the top of your head. You are such a liar. <laughs> no, no, it's an old Australian thing. They always tell tourists, <laughs> the beware drop the drop bear. And it's yeah. the drop bear. You know, the Tasmanian devil's scary enough, I gotta, uh, yeah. I gotta tell you. I don't know why uh, Google didn't know that that was a Tasmanian devil. Maybe it thought it was a cat. I should look through the cat pictures <laughs> and see. Just a very angry cat. Well, pretty much it's a mean-looking animal. Pretty much everything in Australia is deadly for you, even the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they have uh, spiders that'll paralyze you instantly. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's great. My favorite's the tiny little shellfish that's got a stinger in it. And yeah. It hits you. Yeah. Some people have actually tried to kill themselves from the pain. It's just... Oh, that's nice. Ooh, nice. Something yeah. to look forward to. Extra oh, feature. Yes. <laughs> oh. uh, anyway, that was, uh, I think from a consumer point of view, that was probably the big announcement of uh, Google I.O. Yep. Uh, yeah. And I want, you know, Apple's got WWDC coming up. Do you think that they, they're kind of scrambling to try to respond to that? No, they don't care. I don't honestly think Apple gives a monkeys about Google. Yeah. Uh, about Google. Yeah. I mean, the thing was also, I mean, photo is great, but they also announced pay and the fingerprint sensing thing, which Apple was doing right. a year ago. They're so playing catch up like, in other regards. Yeah. yeah, it swings and roundabouts on that one. So Google it is interesting, though. Ben Thompson and I were talking on Twitter about how um, Apple... You know, devices are what they're all about, right? So services, in a way, are just a way to try and get people to buy and use their devices. 
And Google's the exact opposite. So it doesn't actually care about devices. Right. Devices are just a way to get people to use Google services, which it helps explain why Apple devices are so great and their services are terrible. Mm -hmm. And Google's services are great, but their devices aren't so good. It also means it's tough to compete with Google if, if for instance, mm -hmm. Apple... It's not in Apple's interest to give away cloud storage. I mean, that's no. that's a profit center. They need to they right. need to they need to charge for that. Yep. But Google, because they make money elsewhere, other, otherwise, kind of right. in this kind of nebulous, use the net more, we'll make more money kind of thing, um, they can and they could put a lot of resources into it. That makes it very hard to compete. It's uh, although if you think about it, Apple has a hundred and forty billion dollars in cash, mm -hmm. cash and near cash. That's a mind-boggling amount of money. If if you wanted to get smart about a cloud service, could you could just hire people and buy things and build things? I mean, if they really really wanted to, it's not as though they're resource constrained. Well, yeah, but it's not even it's not in their business model because Apple customers right. are people who will pay a price premium for right. what they consider exactly. to be good, and yeah. be it if it even if it isn't very good. Um, so I mean, it's they're really quite happy to keep prices high and let Google race for the bottom on that one. True. There's an advantage, though, that Google has, and this is where Apple might come up against, come a, come a cropper, to use a phrase <laughs> you might have used, Ian, if I'd let you, uh, is that Google, because they give away all these services, because they have all these photos, are going to be able to do deep data mining in ways mm -hmm. that Apple, because they are yeah, you know, pr exactly. promoting privacy, can't. You already see this with Google now. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, I mean, I wonder how soon before I get uh, photographic analytics from Google. You know, 32% mm -hmm. of your photos are of food. The caloric content of most of the pictures <laughs> is high. Hello, Serenity Caldwell. Hi, I'm <laughs> Welcome. It's pouring Serenity. rain. Hi. Great to have you. Uh, traffic in Boston being what it is, I'm amazed you're here at all. But thank you. Yes. No, I am glad to be there. No, the... Um, I think it's really interesting, uh, Google's sort of... So, uh, of course, there was the interview with Bradley Horowitz uh, that Stephen Levy did over on Medium, I think the day that this mm -hmm. was announced at the keynote. Um, and in the, that, that, in, that interview has a, a couple of very interesting sound bites, including the fun fact where they're like, oh, well, we have no current plans to use all of our analytical data that we're mining from your photos for advertising. But we're not ruling it out if, say, and he used something really funny, like, oh, if, say, Tesla had a recall and we noticed that you had a Tesla wow. in, the, in the photos, we'd be able to tell you about that. Mm. Um, but and wouldn't that be phrase, good? Isn't that good or is that, is that good. not good? Well, it's a potential be to be good. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I don't know. People, people tend to take the, the argument of like Google is evil because they're mining your data or Google is wonderful because they're trying to make your life easier. And I don't think it's a, it's a company. It's not a person. It doesn't right. it doesn't be it like could let's, be either one. let's. Yeah, exactly. It just depends yeah. on what you value from your services. Right. On In fact, one it hand, might even it, be it might even be evil accidentally. Right. Yeah, it might not exactly. actually set out to be evil. Exactly. Like, I think they actually have, you know, I wrote a pretty, a pretty, not necessarily critical piece earlier this week, but just kind of a, like, just be aware of, uh, of the potential of what Google could do for your photos, which is, from on one hand, it's going to make it much easier for you to search your photos, because you will be able to get that quick, real time, mm. oh, all auto face detection and all of that. We just but did Google, that. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I, I saw the tail end of that right there. Well, um, and I, you know, I, I think that that's really cool. And I think that that's amazing technology. But then you look at the flip side where currently Google Photos doesn't analyze who's in the photos, but it could at one point, you know, at, at down the line, it could analyze who's in the photos. It could analyze what place you've been at. And it's like, oh, this person, you know, you're, you're intimate with this person in this photo and you're at this restaurant and you seem to go there, you know, quite often. So I'm going to show you ads um, in Gmail or something for a coupon for this restaurant. And on one hand, that's really awesome because yay, we go to this restaurant a lot and coupons are always nice. But on the other hand, you think about that kind of data and you think about their ability to collect that kind of data um, that, you know, they could either do really wonderful things with it, like offer you coupons and offer you relevant information, 
or that kind of data could be misused. And I don't necessarily think even Google is the person is the company or the person that would misuse that data. It's just if that data is being collected and if that data is being stored somewhere, heaven for fend that, you know, either that data is compromised or that, you know, or someone decides to take a vested interest in like, hmm, this, you know, this data could potentially get me the information of millions of customers. And uh, I was, to, you know, I was reading um, that old article. Says, Do you guys remember a couple years back when the New York Times interview or was uh, interviewing, I think, the former sales director of Target, who was talking about how mm-hmm. they pre-plan circulars to figure out how people are pregnant before they even know yep. or even tell anybody yeah, else? That was a great article. Fascinating yeah. story. Yeah. It was Target yeah, knew 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 somebody was pregnant before her parents did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. because of what she bought, because of how she wandered the store. Yeah, yeah. exactly because of the things that she was putting in her cart and those kind and the it had the telling line where it's like, well, we found that when we we send people circulars that have all baby items in them and they haven't told anybody they're pregnant, they find that really really creepy. Mm-hmm. But say if you know we send them this circular. Um, and it it has random things peppered in it, like a lawnmower or like a <laughs> beer that they would never buy. They just think, oh, it's this is random. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, everybody gets this. Everybody gets uh, this circular. And uh, hey, this is this is a great coupon for for baby items, and I'm going to need this in two months. But it's it's that kind of a thought, right? Where you know, there's the there's the level of like, how much data can we? can we use that we've collected about you without you being like, okay, that's weird. Yeah. Um, so, I think yeah, Google anyway. is Google. doing face recognition because I just searched for my son's name, Henry. And I was, yes. I mean, I know it does face recognition, but I think it matches it to a name because then now I found all these pictures of Henry as both an adult and a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, and I don't think I tagged them in any particular way. I've done the same no. thing. Yeah. So, I think it's that, interesting. I mean, let's, let's it is it. doing it's face just, matching. I mean, it's definitely it's not just photos. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Google now the whole the whole the whole sort of promise of Google now is that they'll know so much about you that they can suggest helpful things. But knowing that much about you means they know a lot about you, and they can also probably, if they wanted to, they could suggest not so nice things, or they could someone seeing that data could suggest not so nice things. So it's, I mean, I think you're right. Serenity, it's not, may not be actively evil or good, but it ha- definitely has good and evil applications. There is a burden. That, by the way, is that Ian why you didn't give them all your photos? I don't like giving for, giving that much information out for free. I mean, the Senate's currently debating the Patriot Act this very day. They've come into recess to do it. And I'm not that worried about Google, to be honest. I'm more worried about a lawful request from a new law that's been mm-hmm. passed that says, right, right, we have the right to scoop all that yes. data. And, exactly. you know, you, why make it easy for them? That's all I feel. I think, though, that there's a risk that, well, I don't know. I See, I really like this. <laughs> and I really <laughs> want this. And I want Google now. And I would be thrilled if I had a Google pair of Google augmented reality glasses that would pop up people's names and reputation mm-hmm. scores as I walked around. This would be valuable to me. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a risk that by overstating the risks... We could eliminate a really useful thing. I mean, we, we, you know, I guess there's always been a b- debate about new technologies. You know, jacquard looms, uh, oh, God, let's destroy those because it put us right. out of business. That debate's always happened. But I just, I fear that we won't get some innovations that could be very valuable on balance because of, of kind of a, a tenuous or a nebulous fear of something that isn't real, a, a, tech, a, techno, a techno panic. Uh, yeah, that's I'd the th- worry. Sorry, go on, please. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, that that is the worry. That is the it's the frustrating balance between mm-hmm. how much how much privacy can we potentially compromise at the at the extent of innovation. But well, also I, there's know. a burden if you're going to say what if there's a burden on you to say how great that possibility is. I mean, it's very easy oh, to absolutely. say what if. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm sorry. I, de- yes. I, I deal with the security beat uh, an awful lot security. on the reg. Yeah. yeah. And OK, two, three years ago. Uh, I was being called paranoid for suggesting some of the things I'd suggested were going on. And then when the Snowden leaks came out, we realized quite how deep down that hole we were. I think that led a lot of people to say, actually, no, I'm pulling back from that. And that's why Google and Apple and others are really having problems with the NSA at the moment. Stormtroopers aren't knocking on our doors and... (laughs) 
<laughs> taking us away in the dead of night to a cell. Uh, I mean, that hasn't happened yet, has it? Uh, yet no. being the crucial word on that one. Well, you, but that's the problem is I can presume all sorts of moral injury. Uh, but why take the risk? Yeah, because I get thing. great it's... stuff out of it. Like I could type, you know, <laughs> marmot and get wombats or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but Leo, it's it's more a it's more a perfect like a protection of your personal privacy. Where you're, you know, you can be willing to give as much as you want to a certain service and just be like, you know what, I've accepted that a certain. I mean, anyone who's on the internet and who is active on the internet has to basically signs a contract, basically being like, I am giving a certain my, amount of myself away. I'm on Twitter. People might divulge where what cafes I'm at um, if they follow me intently and they really want to find out, like if someone wants to find out where you live, they really, they really will find out where you live. It's, it's, it's not that hard ultimately, but it's a question of like, how much of this stuff am I voluntarily giving over at four, four great things? Um, well, and, and I think it's how much you know, how much you know about what Google's going to do with it, right? Yes. Like it's how how much is Google disclosing about what they do with the data, what they could do with the data? Is it being anonymized? Is it you know, uh, there has to be a certain amount of information that they give you so that you can make an informed choice about whether to do it or not. Yeah, and I did find it really interesting. Um, you know, at, something that Apple I think does really well in this sphere is that they make it very clear. All right, this is exactly what we're doing with your data when it gets uploaded to iCloud and all of that, and this is what we will never do with your data. Um, and that does come at a bit of a cost premium because they do charge for it rather than just making the services free with Google. But Google, I feel like, obfuscates that a lot. They've gotten better about it, uh, but this still, you know, when Google Photos came out. Um, and I was looking at the splash page, you know, it's like this beautiful thing. Here are all of the magical things that it can do. And you cannot like the, the, the terms and conditions, the privacy policy, you don't even have to like check a box to sign up for mm. it. If you have a Google account, you are opted in to Google. <laughs> you already yeah. checked that box, yeah, baby. Already, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Long That's time already ago. Yours. That's already yours. And if you've uploaded any photos, those are our, to Google Plus's uh, photos thing. Those are already in Google but, Photos. But are you and there's no, there's no, there's just no obvious like, here's what we do with this. Here's what we don't. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it wasn't for that Bradley Horowitz interview, I would still be combing through Google's privacy policy, trying to figure out what specifically applied to photos versus is what was applied to say Gmail, and I think it's really no, telling that he's that he's saying like, oh, this is going to be Google Photos is going to be Gmail for your photos, and I think Gmail did a lot of wonderful things. I do use Gmail, but there are also downsides of Gmail. You know, we've we've discovered just how but, deep that rabbit that advertising rabbit hole goes. When the feds come, are they going to haul away everybody who's Google, but everybody from Apple is going to be safe? No, I mean, no, not at no, all. No. I mean, but it's it's a question of. Uh, I, I think just taking a fundamental view about your privacy. And yes, as someone with a, a fairly poor memory, I want those glasses that will whisper in your ear who it is you're talking to yeah. and you've forgotten their name. I want all that stuff. That's fine, but I'm not prepared to give up a certain amount for, to do that. I use Gmail every day. I use it for work and I use it for personal, personal business. You know, I share stuff on Twitter. I share stuff on Facebook. But you've got to be aware of what you're sharing and why you're sharing mm -hmm. it. It's just being aware, I really think, is that awareness is the key factor. Like if you I just know don't want what... Alex Jones to determine what kind of features <laughs> I get in the internet. Uh, because, you know, there are None people... of us want that, Leo. Well, no. no, some of us do want Nobody that. Wants... They're in the chat Nobody room right that. now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Biscuit Dev says, Leo, you sound like a smoker with a craving for his ciggies. Yeah, I'm hooked. That's a British word. That's a British word, <laughs> ciggies. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm hooked. I acknowledge it. Um, well, you do have a choice. I mean, it's uh, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I mean, and you even have the choice not to use the internet at all if you really want yeah, to be you private. Yeah, if you, you really know. want to be paranoid, absolutely. Well, yeah, but but then I you've mean, got to go and live on a farm somewhere. You know, it's just, yeah, exactly. actually, there's friends. a life. If you don't want modern conveniences, you have to live on a farm or somewhere. Yeah, and at this disconnected. Point. This is the. This I is, have friends who won't who won't upload photos of their kids to yeah. Facebook or to Google because they just don't want to take the risk of those photos. You know, going somewhere and, they don't and, want. And I people. certainly don't begrudge them that. That's their absolute oh. right. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to. I mean, there's nobody suggesting you have to do this. No. No, of course. And I, 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 I mean, uh, go ahead. Oh no, I'm just saying, uh, if you do it, you've got to be aware that yes. you, of what you are doing I and agree. what you are sharing. And if you're actually going to stick photos up on, I mean, I stick photos up on Facebook, on on Twitter, and that sort of thing. Yeah. But you've always got to have in the back of your mind, you're sharing this with everyone. Think right. about what you're doing before you do it. You know, it, it's it's just 
some people don't feel strongly about it, and I respect that decision totally. But for me personally, it's just the way I roll. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just about, especially the folks, you know, we, we talk about our tech savvy people. We also talk, you know, my parents who who are aware of tech and who use tech every day, but may not realize, oh, if I upload this food, this photo to Google Photos, even if I set it to private and I never share it with anyone, there is a small possibility that someone else may see that data or that mm -hmm. data may get used for advertising. And it's just about people being aware, like yeah. being able to tell the public, hey, this is what's, you know, this is what's mm -hmm. going on. Not fear mongering, not saying this is the worst thing ever and it's all going to, you know, be terrible, but just it, knowing this is a, you know, this is this is a thing. This is a thing. I'm just saying happen. I want I that choice totally too. I don't want the lowest common denominator of privacy uh, or the highest common denominator of privacy to determine what I can do. And that's what I fear. I think if, if you, if you, uh, if you have, if everybody's rattling the cage, oh my God, we got to protect our privacy. And so there's, well, Google never, uh, even though Google, I'm sure, has face recognition, mm -hmm. they're never going to implement it because of people like you. <laughs> Damn you. They will make it I an option. Then I, then I don't get yeah, a choice, so, right? They will make it an option. The number of people like me compared to the total no, internet, they, internet that habit they can't make is an option. Tiny percentage. Because then the people who will opt in will be all the stalkers and creeps. And so and they, they said they. They said they deliberately didn't do it yeah. with Google Glass because they were afraid of the repercussions. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's kind of what I'm arguing is, gosh, you guys are, you know, the techno Amish out here are keeping us <laughs> from living in the future because you guys want to live in the past. Fair, I think it is fair to point out, though, that Google isn't just giving millions of people photo storage with terabytes of data be out of the goodness right. of its heart. Yeah, well, right? that's I mean, kind of my question. Trying, what is it? Company. What is it yeah. they get out of They're this? a company. They are bringing in that stuff, just like they're giving you voice recognition and, and automatically recognizing your voicemails and so on because they want the data and so that they can learn more about you and people like you and and learn how to do things with that data, that you are providing them yeah, like that Google now, content just so great. that they yeah. can use it. Not exactly. for bad reasons, but they're for their own reasons. Yeah, well, they, yeah. I presume it has to do with advertising. Advertising, sure. I do. So I certainly think is part of it. Um, mm -hmm. In Google terms now. of Google, yeah. Well, in terms of Google as a company, as a whole, I mean, if you look at all of Google's goals going back to the the very origin of Google, I feel like their their goal from day one has been: we want to not only understand humanity, but we want to build the biggest database about humanity possible. Right. Because then we can learn things from it and then we can build really smart computers. And that's where the mm -hmm. super, you know, paranoid, scary Skynet. people go off in Skynet. Yeah, exactly. Where it's like, we are teaching computers so many things that, you know, if AGI or ASI ever gets flipped on, this will be a very interesting, interesting progression. But um, in general, I, I don't think that they're collecting the data solely for advertising. I think they have a genuine interest in just, we want to build a really cool database. I mean, they're nerds at heart, right? They, they want to build a big picture. It's and I know, they said something I haven't heard them say in a while, which was the original mission of Google, which is to organize the world's information. Yep. They used mm -hmm. that phrase at I.O. I hadn't heard that in a while from Google. They used it in the in the press conference over the, over the photo app. They were saying, yeah. basically, we want to organize your memories. And it does do a very good job of it. I think, uh, Serenity, you're right in the terms of this database has obviously given them a big advantage in machine learning because mm -hmm. photo de depends on this, the whole Gmail advertising system depends on this, and they've obviously got way ahead of the pack when it comes to deep machine learning, and that's going to be really interesting and potentially useful. You may yet get especially your things, <laughs> Especially things like, like Google Now. They use that data to be able to recommend things to you, to be able to understand your behavior, to be able to say to Leo, you know, there's some. There's a new wombat calendar out. You might want to get it because we know you like wombats. Um, you know their their ability to offer other services that are useful like that is based on the data that they've built up over the last ten years about you. I just yeah, I, I am glad to give you and everybody else the choice to not participate. That's fine. Just please don't let your terror of technology keep me from getting some of the cool stuff I want. It's not terror, and, you know, if, just as you are happy for me to do this, I'm happy for you to do your stuff as well. I'm giving them everything. And the number of people <laughs> out there who are actually withholding information in this way it's minimal. is so small, it's yeah. not going to hold up technology I development. No, I don't think so. But actually, you made a point that, that I thought was interesting. It's not that Google might do something bad itself deliberately. Hmm. It's that the data that it has accumulated could be used by someone else, say the government, to do something bad and Google would have no choice 
but to give up that information. Exactly. So it's not so much that they're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if a law exactly. comes in saying you have to hand this over, right. they have to comply with lawful requests. So, toast. You Is know? anybody live blogging uh, the Senate's uh, session right now? I don't know. That actually. would be good I'd to be have an eye on it. To keep an eye on it, because uh, as you know, the uh, sunset. Uh, June 1st at midnight is sunset for yep. uh, Section 215. Mm -hmm. I think the whole Patriot Act is uh, sunsetted in just a few hours. Uh, it's three It's it's three key sections of it, including oh, okay. Section 215. Five hours, uh, 11 minutes, and 40 <clears throat> seconds. Um, so uh, they're meeting uh, right now. Mitch McConnell's going, you got to pass this Patriot Act. Oh, Mitch and McConnell wants the Patriot Act permanently. He wants a permanent oh, Patriot Act. Yeah. Him, I'm afraid of. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm not, I don't want Google to give him my information. Well, also, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trust him to find his own backside with both hands yeah. on the torch, let alone get that access to my full data. Yeah. Uh, this is the EFF article: Why Mitch McConnell cannot be allowed to decide the fate of the Patriot Act. You know, I'm I'm no f no fan of uh, the Paul family and Rand Paul, but boy, he's fighting the good fight there. Yeah, and uh, I, I have to support him for that. So we'll we'll try to keep an eye on that if you're watching live, uh, because. Uh, there's five hours left for the Senate to do something to keep. It will sunset if they do nothing. Well, yeah, I mean, it might sunset for a day or two, but at the end of the day, that's <laughs> not going to mean only... that ISIS yeah. are swarming into the U.S. borders yeah. with hate in their hearts. It, yeah, and as uh, you know, a, a better piece of legislation would be fine. And yeah. I think Rand Paul is mad as a sack of badgers most of the time, but on this one, he's actually right. Yeah. Um, we'll watch the sunset. The sunset on Section Two Fifteen. Mm. It's going to be a beautiful image, that sunset. <laughs> hey. Put that on my Google. My Again, making us, uh, it looks see. like Twitter has a live feed going. Oh, of course, it's Twitter does. Hashtag Patriot Act. The world surprise, happens surprise. on Twitter these days. Well, I'll load that up, and we'll keep an eye on it. Meanwhile, we got a great panel. This is, going to, this is already fun, and it's going to get funner. That's not a word, is it? Ah, well, what the hell? You make them up. It is I think Apple it. used it at some point. <laughs> yeah. The iPod. If you could say, even funner. If you could say Siggy's, I could say funner. No, oh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew Ingram is here from Fortune Magazine. Ian Thompson from The Register from Serenity Caldwell. I didn't give you credit, so I'll say Serenity Caldwell from imore.com. Wonderful panel of people talking about the week's news. We'll continue on in uh, just a moment. Our show today brought to you by Personal Capital. I love personal capital. You know, if uh, it's important to plan for your future, uh, it's important to save, it's important to invest. But I think so many people just kind of stick that money somewhere and forget about it. Or worse, they're using a broker, but a broker who doesn't have their best interests at heart. A broker who's working on commission, who's pushing products on you because he'll make more money or encouraging you to trade more because he makes money every time you trade, that's going to shave years off of your retirement. I don't want you to do that. I want you to try personal capital right now. Uh, personal capital is free. It's absolutely secure. They have mobile apps, as you can see, for iOS, for Android, for the Amazon Kindle store. They also have uh, watch apps. They have a watch for an Android Wear and now for an Apple Watch that will keep you up to date on what's going on with your investments. And their tools will help you plan for the future. This is all completely free. Open your free account, link your investment and bank accounts. In seconds, a dashboard of your complete net worth will be there, updated in real time in one secure place. Now, that's part one. Part two is, per, and you don't have to use this, I want to point out, it's a freemium model. And uh, most people don't. Most people just take the free stuff. But they are also an SEC-registered financial advisors. They're not brokers. They have a fiduciary responsibility to look out for your best interest. They don't work on commission. But they can give you very, very good advice. And to give you a sense of what they can do, if you put uh, $100,000 or more in assets into the personal capital dashboard, you'll get a free 30-minute review. The, the, I, I did it. It's really straightforward. Very valuable. You talk about your goals, your risk tolerance, when you plan to retire, you know, your time horizon, and what you've got for investments now. And they're really good. I was very impressed. Take control of your financial future, personal capital. They give you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. And it's free. You even get a free no-obligation portfolio consultation if you link more than $100,000 in assets on the dashboard. Personalcapital.com slash twit to try it today. I've been using it for, it's almost three years now, personalcapital.com slash twit. We thank them this, uh, for their support of this week in 
Tech. What's the hashtag for? As should I just Section Two Fifteen? Or uh, I'm doing Patriot Act at the moment. Yeah, that's a good one. That's what I was looking good. at. I shall do that. What is the opposite of patriotic? Patriot Act. <laughs> yeah, okay. Funny, funny. <laughs> <laughs> It's fun, you know. This is a like the discussion we just had. There are two sides to this discussion too. I, President Obama says, "I, you know, I don't want to be the, I don't want it on my watch that there is a terrorist act that we could have found out about, but we didn't because we didn't let the NSA do its job." <sighs> is not an unreasonable point of view. Well, if you look at right, if you read the no nine evidence, oh. there's absolutely no evidence that, it helps. that they've been able, yeah. right. To exactly. actually stop anything, despite all of this bulk collection. Yeah. If they had even one example, not even a very good one, that would be great. But there's zero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we already in the 9/11 report, they said explicitly, all the legal process was there that was needed to get the information which could have stopped the attacks, but it wasn't gelled together and examined in the way which which people teased out these little things from there. And as as you say, Matthew, I mean, there they haven't been able to give us. A single example beyond one Somali taxi driver who gave three thousand two hundred dollars to a, a terrorist group right. from this whole thing. So why are we paying for it? Why are we doing it? What? Uh, but they're the ex. Okay, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. They're the experts. <laughs> if they are want they these tools, uh, I, do you think that the NSA they're evil, or I think they're patriots? I think they're trying to. They're doing their best to protect us. I think a lot of people at the NSA are patriots, but there's a certain kind of mindset which means. If we can grab this data, why let's not? Get it. Why not? Yeah. Well, you know, and this data is very... all out there. So they could ask the telephone companies for it. They could ask Google for it, but they want it themselves. And, and the point um, is, it's not targeted in any way. You know, there there are ways to get to collect data that is relevant. There are processes to go through. This is not that. This is collecting everything you say and do and click on and look at, just in case, maybe randomly, you might be involved in something bad, and they can figure that out. Now, it's Matthew, you're Canadian. You don't happen. care. I mean, you just are you watching this like a sporting event, like you, you know, <laughs> or do you care? I do care. I mean, I obviously it it doesn't it affects me secondarily. You know, it affects me when I use services like Google or when I enter the U.S. or when I deal with with companies in the U.S. But I'm, I mean, I'm I'm positive they're grabbing my clicks and my stream right. and my everything. Either they're getting it directly. Or they've got to deal with the Canadian version of the NSA to, to trade data. So I know it's happening. And I think the it's the indiscriminate nature of it that that bothers me. It's not it's not that they're doing it. It's that they're doing it with everyone and all of their data without without any kind of targeting. That's what bothers me. So there you go. We have it on the screen. This is C SPAN two. Uh, they're voting now whether to limit debate. So that's a cloture vote, right? Yeah. Uh, 70, mm -hmm. 76 to 17. It looks like that has passed. So cl they've got cloture. They've ended debate on it. Uh, that means they will get at least to vote on a bill. Well, presumably that's they're going to be voting on USA Freedom. I mean, Mitch McConnell's got his own bill. Ah. He straight up reauthorizes yeah. it. But okay. USA Freedom is up for the vote. That's the one that was passed uh, in the House of Representatives, limiting the mass collection of phone data. Just a little bit. The Senate could not get a uh, cloture. They couldn't get the supermajority needed no. to vote on it last time. No. They, as they reconvene, maybe that's what's going on right now. It's hard to hard to follow. They just look like they're standing there, which I, is <laughs> mostly what arguments. I... Yeah, they just kind of stand there a lot uh, <laughs> and look around. All governments. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, we've got this problem in the UK at the moment. They're just about to put a snoopers, a snoopers charter through. And our new prime minister wants to ban all applications with encryption that can't be unlocked by the government. He also oh, wants goody. to uh, to yeah. ban all... What is he... We, what, was, what did Cameron say that was? we talked about it last time you were here? It was so yeah. wild. Yeah, was he's... It, was, oh, he's, sure he, was, he, he wants... Yeah. Basically, you cannot use an encryption scheme in the UK that cannot be broken by... Uh, law enforcement. No, but he also said we should no longer tolerate free speech because... Right. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> what a delightful quote that was, coming from an old Etonian like himself. Yes, we've, we've perhaps been too open-minded. Yeah, well, let's our not be so open-minded, okay? Well, say, yeah, that's very easy for you to say, but, you know, if you're part of the people who come to the UK from outside and who make up the UK mostly these days, that's a little insulting. Just a little bit. Yeah. And I hope he's made to eat those words. You've got C-51 uh, up up north. We sure do, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it's trying to do something similar. I mean, C-51 is, is... I'm trying to remember where it is exactly in the 
Um, but it, the fundamentally the the intent is the same to to do as much sort of monitoring as possible. Yeah. Um, it's you know anti terrorism. So the the rationale is that we need to do these things in order to stop uh, terrorists. Um, but I, I think the you know the the risk in my mind is that you it's a little like the asking people to to give the police a key in case they want to come in and look around your house just in case you're doing something bad. Um, will they do it? Maybe not. But in in a way, you give up a little bit of freedom each time you do that. In return for what? In yeah. return for some theoretical potential benefit that you might get at some future point. Yeah, it feels to me a little bit like, say, you're in a relationship with a guy or with a girl who's like, you know, I love you. Let's, you know, we're 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 such wonderful couple. Um, we should share each other's location data. You know, we should share each other's passwords. You know, just just yeah, for for openness' sake, for just a, <laughs> just in case. And then, Isn't that a are you know, saying I shouldn't do that? Are you saying you shouldn't? Do that? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, I think I think it's different. I think that Honey. you know, in some in some cases, it's fine. But it's when it, it's when the person like intentionally is like, so we yeah. should share these things. Yeah. And then two months later, you get a day like, why were you at the grocery store? Yeah. What mm -hmm. were you doing at the grocery store at three in the morning? Yeah. And that's kind of what I feel like the NSA is sometimes, where it's like it collects all of this. You're data saying the NSA is a bad girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> or an obsessive, an obsessive boyfriend maybe. or girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's definitely not an abusive not necessarily. relationship for sure. It is absolutely. Well, it's it's like but I'm what you were saying. Trying to protect you. Well, like, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm just looking out for looking you know. Out I'm looking you. out for our relationship. Yeah. I want everything to be you know to be kosher <laughs> and wonderful. Uh, no, I. I it frustrates me because yes, I do think that there are potentially valid uses for this data, but it's like he was he was saying it was it's just it's so much data, it's so much data. They have you know they have uh, giant data farms that they are putting all of this data into. It would take months for them to sort through it, even with computers. Yeah, I'm not um, even fact, convinced they can do the things that they say they want to do. They want I'm not to, even convinced yeah. that they can actually find the things they say they want to find. I mean, you know it's, what? It's actually funny um, is that if they really wanted to develop a smart system for this, where they just collected the data that was potentially important, Google would actually be the company to work with. I, on I this was thinking because, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but if the if if the headline U.S. government and Google working to, or NSA and Google working together to create smart algorithm, the world would explode. But <laughs> but. You know, they are the people with with the knowledge in this area. They are the they are the company that actually knows, okay, we we did collect a bunch of data and now we know how to create smart algorithms that, you know, target very specific sets of data. On the other so, hand, Google are ultra pissed at the NSA at the moment when they found out they were tapping <laughs> the interconnects between their data sets. You kind of feel like mm -hmm. they might be yeah, I, what, I'm never sure they're not protesting too much. You know, all of these companies, oh, don't do that. No, every single they're Google engineer I've spoken yeah. to about this is yeah. furious Livid. about that. Yeah. Livid. Yeah. They use words we can't use on the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't... Special no, no, no. words. <laughs> don't bugger all. Something it is like interesting, that, though. It is interesting, since you mentioned C51, one of the, one of the sort of frightening aspects of that bill, it's very similar to what Cameron was talking about. It's restrictions on speech. So it's not just uh, trying to track people who might do something bad. It's actually trying to restrict people's ability to say things that mm -hmm. could be interpreted in bad ways. And I, just, I think that's a, you know, that's a depressing sort of um, evolution of protection. I'm resisting being just kind of a paranoid crazy, paranoid any government crazy. Uh, and going down that road, uh, because I don't, I, I, I kind hey, so is, are we in actually perilous times, like more so than always, or is this just kind of the normal, isn't, it's always been this way, or is there something really, to, is this, are we like Germans in, uh, Germany in 1938? Are we, I mean, what is, what, what is Give me some historical context. What's the rationale? You mean? Well, I'm just. Is I the, wonder. Is how serious of a how much threat danger is this? are we actually? How much danger yeah. are we in? Well, I, I can say I, as, a, as a foreigner who's come to this country seven years ago, things have moved 
in a more scary way yeah. uh, than they I have in the past. You. But the key concern is not you know what the government is now and what they're doing now. The fact is, storage is cheap and storage is permanent. So, yeah, the government now may be fine. 30 years down the line, if things get really weird and they've got all this material to go back to, um, then it's probably not going to be fine. But you're taking a gamble as to whether things are going to get better or worse politically. And got to say, over the last seven years, look, a little bit worse is probably the way. I think if you look at, if you're trying to compare it to something historically, I, I think you would find a lot of NSA advocates and a lot of you know government security types would argue that the kind of situation, the, the environment we're in now is not even remotely comparable to past wars because we're talking about agencies and entities that that you can't even really put your finger on they don't have they're not armies they're not um typical sort of you know combatants in a war you have people who become radicalized and then join a shadowy group that's connected to some other shadowy group and then explosions happen and people are killed and that's a very very difficult thing militarily to to protect against or to fight and so i think that's if there's one rationale that's used it's that the threat is everywhere or the potential threat is everywhere. And so we need ears, ears everywhere and eyes everywhere. And we need the Batman thing where we're listening to every phone conversation <laughs> that anyone is having because in order to protect people. You know, that's yeah, is that not, not true. No, I don't think no. it's true at all. Okay. I was very nearly killed by an IRA bomb. I was, I was standing wow. standing in London, right in, London in Holy <clears throat> cow. 91 Victoria Coach Station. There was a about a two pound bomb in a litter bin, which I was standing next to, having a cigarette and reading Holy my paper before God. getting on the train. And literally five minutes after I left the station, it exploded, one dead, thirty nine injured. Now, as it turns out, it's possible that fun that bomb was partially funded by people in the US who were giving money to the IRA. Right. But even so, I would love to know who planted that bomb. I would love to actually get into a room with him with a crowbar. But I'm not prepared to give up everyone's privacy just for that right. And I think you've got to have a <clears throat> So we a have to take a few casualties? We just yeah. have to take it? I'm sorry, you really do. I mean, everywhere else around the world has lived with terrorism for a very long time. And the minute the USA got hit, then it seemed to lose its mind over this. I expected better of the it's country. It's true. I agree with you. I think we I did just, lose our... We, we really reacted uh, in a knee-jerk fashion, in a, in a, uh, a reactionary way. It's well, we're very protective over our citizens in the U.S. Yeah. We're very protective well, over, and we're and over our right to yeah. We're we're protective over our right to freedom. We're protective over our country. We fought hard for this country, and I mean that may not you know most of the most of the people who have been in active duty may be retired or you know may have just had recent influence in in Iraq, but we still have that you know that undercurrent running through the government, and that leads again. I feel like the NSA, all of this. I, I do believe was started with somewhat noble intentions in the well we can't ever let this happen again. How are we blindsided? How you know how 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 did we you know lose? How did we lose? How did we how did we let this you know this giant horrible disaster happen? Uh, but I feel like over you become like a ugh, this is a weird a weird thing. But there was a there was a movie called like Bright Eyes or Blue Eyes or Steel or something like that, and it's about a woman whose husband or fiance gets murdered in Central Park and then she goes basically she she gets a gun and then she starts going vigilante over anybody being being crazy or you take the, it's, wait, uh, the every Batman. Charles Bronson movie ever <laughs> pretty much yeah pretty much no but it's but it's that kind of a thing where it starts small it starts like well I can't let ever let myself be vulnerable again I can't ever right. let myself be hurting again and then the next thing mm -hmm. that you know, you know, you're you're going around doing vigilante work, or you're you're collecting so much data that you've turned into somebody that you don't recognize anymore. And, and that's, that's what I kind risk. of feel about the NSA. I think that's the risk. The risk is that you do a whole bunch of things that seem rational, and you give up tiny, tiny bits of your freedom, or tiny, tiny bits of your privacy, or whatever. And but before you know it, you're, you've slid down this slippery slope, and you can't get back. And well, you is, are in a place yeah. that you don't like. Well, this is it. It never comes back. I mean, the, we're seeing the USA Freedom Act being debated at the moment. You remember, this is the very first piece of legislation which has sought to loosen the amount of surveillance that's going on since 1978. Now, the world has changed a lot since then, and we've had a, an awful lot of stuff coming up. But giving this stuff away is easy. Getting it back is really exactly. tough. Impossible.
incredibly difficult. And when you're giving, you know, if you're giving a couple yards here and a couple yards there and a couple yards here, and then sooner or later you realize that you've given, you know, a couple thousand meters hmm. and you're like, well, now that, you know, that starting line is way over there and trying to inch back that way is a very, yeah, very impossible. difficult. I realize I'm, I'm mixing metric. And, and yet that may be exactly right now, what's but. happening right now on the floor of the United States Senate. The, that the senators, having realized that we overreacted, that we went too far, are actually considering letting it expire. Isn't that a positive sign? It is. It, a is. Positive it sign. definitely is. Yeah. It's just taken a bloody long time to get it done, and they're doing it in a very half-assed way. If you don't want me saying so. Yeah. I mean, well, and would and they have? Would they have done that at all if it hadn't been without for all Snowden? Of the exactly. All, exactly. Yeah. Thank God for Snowden. I think uh, it's fair to say. He made a huge difference in this discussion. Absolutely. This debate. I mean, I don't a, know if this would be going on right now. A black hat four years ago, I suggested to a, a former member of the FBI that maybe Echelon was being used to spy, spy on European and US businesses. And he had, had an absolute fist at me. Yeah. And then Snowden comes out and it's just like, ah, well, we were doing a little bit of that, but our reasons were good. And you're like, I'm sorry, you know, you've got to have a tight rein on these things. Otherwise, they can get out of control. So, exactly. Uh, if nine out of 10 people can be good, honest patriots or people who really want to uphold the law, if one person out of those those 10, those 100, those 1,000 uh, who has access to that data is not honest or not trustworthy or, you know, has bad intentions, that makes that that destroys the entire concept. Meanwhile, let's uh, look at some shiny new gadgets <laughs> brought to us by the... Lightening the mood. <laughs> shiny. <People. laughs> well, I do feel like we're a little bit distracted to death, aren't we? I mean, nah, we, we've, there, we've, there's we've, no we've, accident that we have these incredible <clears throat> bread and circuses, these uh, spectacles, these gadgets, these toys. Uh, it, it's very tempting just to relax and say, it's okay because I have the newest Galaxy S6 <laughs> and... What could possibly go wrong here? And Let's... I can search all my photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll talk a little bit more about Google I.O. Uh, there's some Apple news, too. WWDC is coming up. Uh, June 8th is well, a little more than a week away. That should be a, a lot of fun. We'll be covering that live next week. Um, we could talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in media. We talked before the show. Uh, Matthew Ingram knows very well uh, how difficult it is for tech blogs to succeed these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it was there another casualty this week, or uh, is it all good? Is it all wonderful? And a life sentence for Ross Ulbricht is uh, it, that's I don't know what to say about that, but that's fascinating. We're going to take a break, come back and talk more about that. We had a good week this week on Twit. Uh, are, do you have a promo ready? Because I, I would just like you to watch this and see what you missed. Previously on Twit. That doesn't look at all dorky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You look like Bender. <laughs> <laughs> Twit live specials. That's jump. An open camera design with a fully integrated version from GoPro. An assembler that turns raw footage into VR video with that. That looks seamless. That's amazing. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's nice. Tech news today. The IRS got hacked. America's tax collection agency, the Internal Revenue Service, disclosed yesterday that hackers gained access to the personal information of more than 100,000 U.S. taxpayers. The main thing that, that, hack, that people suspect that these hackers are going to do with this information is use it to file fraudulent tax returns. The new screensavers. Jim Cutler, our great voiceover guru. So I'm the guy that goes, netcast you love. The chat room wants to know, are you a Fremen? Do you use the spice? I love Fremen. <laughs> I love it under my arms. <laughs> Before you buy. Lighter than air, it's the new Apple MacBook. I don't need another MacBook, but gosh, for traveling, for getting around, this thing is gorgeous, and I love the gold. Twit, now also available in several colors of unapologetic plastic. <laughs> <laughs> we like, we prefer to call it fluorolastima. Thank you very much. That's Jim oh, Cutler. I have a couple of that. <laughs> yes. I, you know, can you do an intervention on Renee Ritchie? How many bands has Renee bought now? Oh my gosh, I think he has one of every kind of the 42 millimeter. Although, I, to be fair, I have one of every color of the sport band, but it was for research oh, uh, and uh. dual matching because that was Wait fun. a minute. You wait a minute. You're not those are those are heterogeneous. I think that's a violation of something. Oh. You're wearing brown and green? Uh green and pink. You can't Oh, that's pink. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. Um, I did. I never I thought did of that. Video. Yeah, You're a I fashion did a video rebel. For I'm more. That was mix and matching. I stole it from Swatch, really. Are you allowed? But to uh, do yeah. That? I don't think so. I think Tim Cook's gonna. You're gonna hear from Tim Cook. Probably Johnny. Let's be fair. <laughs> the Apple guys are gonna come by your house. We didn't design the most beautiful watch <laughs> we've ever made, so you could ruin it by mixing bands. <laughs> so starting this week, we're implementing band copy protection. <laughs> we'll prevent people from doing that. <laughs> You know, the yeah. Taptic Engine, it can secretly give you a shock if you're using the watch in a way <laughs> that we don't know like. Is there's a needle buried deep within the watch. <laughs> <laughs> the tiny drop of strychnine. Our show today brought to you by Gazelle. If you are hankering for something new and shiny, you know, the, the right thing to do would be to take the old shiny and sell it on Gazelle. Don't put it in the drawer where it's going to gather dust. Don't throw it into the landfill. There are plenty of people who would like your, your old iPhone, your old iPad your Samsung or Galaxy uh, device, your BlackBerry, your tablets. Gazelle pays top dollar. And you know what's great? You can go to Gazelle right now, get a quote, and that quote's locked in for 30 days. So you have plenty of time to think about it, to ponder, to get the new device, to copy the data over. If you forget to wipe the data on your old device, they'll do it for you. In fact, they even buy broken iPhones and iPads. And of course, you wouldn't be able to wipe the data on that, but they'll take care of that for you. They're great. Then you might say, well, what happens to these fabulous... Oh, and by the way, when you do sell them, They'll send you a box, postage paid on anything worth more than a buck. So you don't even pay postage on that. And they turn it around fast. They'll give you a cash check or PayPal credit or Amazon gift card. That is a nice thing because they bump the Amazon gift card up 5%. But you may ask, as I am often asked, well, what happens to those gadgets? Well, the very best gadgets that Gazelle gets, they sell back in their certified pre-owned program from Gazelle. Devices are available. You can get, uh, I think, iPhones, iPads, and Galaxy devices. They're in two conditions. Certified like new, like new. Certified good. Show some gentle signs of wear, but you know they work 100%. And you save, of course, some extra money. Uh, you get a great device at a great price. Gazelle's put everything through their 30-point inspection process. It's absolutely rigorous. Everything's fully functional. And, of course, certified pre-owned devices are backed by a 30-day risk-free return policy. If you want a new gadget, do the right thing. Bring it to Gazelle or buy it from Gazelle. You can do both. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, gazelle.com. Great panel here. Serenity Caldwell, Ian Thompson, Matthew Ingram. So, so, you know what I like about all of you? You all have uh, uh, distinct voices. Uh, and I don't mean speaking voices. I mean writing voice. Your, 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 your positions are clear and distinct. And I love that. Um, in fact, that's we kind of live in the age of uh, personality media more than ever before. Even anchors, you know, are a little bit more distinct. But boy, you get on the web and everybody has a distinct, unique style. And I love that. But I have to, I'm a little worried. First, uh, uh, was GigaOM wasn't even the first to go under. But GigaOM suddenly pulled the plug. Happy to say Matthew Igram and five of his colleagues went to Fortune. Uh, the rest seem to all have found jobs elsewhere as well. Uh, now this week... Uh, Recode, which, if anything, you'd think with Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher, uh, Liz Gaines, I mean, what a great team. John Chmielewski, so many, so many great people there. That was a great blog. And, and Matthew, maybe you know better than I, but the fact that they were sold to Vox Media for stock indicates, does it not, that, the, that they were in, that this was a fire sale, that they needed to sell quick? I don't know if that's if we can jump to that conclusion. Okay. I don't know that it's fair to say it was a fire sale. I have heard reports um, from people close to the company that they had lots of money left. Um, oh, okay. I think I think they, I don't, I don't think they had to sell or certainly had to sell right now. But it feels to me like they felt eventually they were going to have to do something. Right. They were going to have to sell or they were going to have to partner up with somebody because it's just it's harder and harder to make a go of it as a, as a small entity. So, and my analogy is the kind of the barbell effect. I mean, you either have to be super small and sort of hyper-targeted and focused, and I think you're a good example of doing that and how it can work, or you have to be huge and massive and have immense reach and billions of page views. I mean, that's the kind of game we're talking about. They were not either of those things. So they were sort of focused, but still, 
you know, 45 people, that's a fair number. Gigom was arguably in the same kind of category in that kind of valley of death in the middle where you're not big enough to have scale, but you're too big to kind of be hyper-targeted and focused. That's what it feels like to me. And so they saw the writing on the wall and decided, you know, Vox is great. You know, Jim Bankoff is a smart guy. They, they're sort of simpatico on a lot, in a lot of ways. And um, they've got a bunch of money because they just did a huge round. Mm -hmm. Kara said, and she's very honest. That's one of the things we really like about Kara. But we got to get her back on soon. Sometimes too honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She she said uh, to the told the New York Times, everybody's bigger than us. It's not a secret that being a. And by the way, no, because we're smaller than you, Kara. It's not a secret that being a smaller fish is really hard. Kind of implying there were some difficulties at Recode. Well, and I think. My sense was that one of those difficulties was if you're an independent entity like them, you have to have your own back end. You have to build your own stuff. You have to do all your right. own ad sales. You have to have all of that stuff yourself. That adds a huge amount of, you know, just cost and it's time consuming and it's it's much easier to use the, the resources of a larger entity. And I think that was an appeal for them. I've got From to say, my impression, oh. oh, go ahead, Eddie. Oh no, so I was just going to say. I mean, when when the news came out, I was a, a bit shocked because I mean, Cara in particular, Anna Freed, Walt Moss were great journalists all, mm -hmm. um, but they got forty four employees on a hit count of was it one point five million mm -hmm. uniques a month. Mm -hmm. That's an awful lot of stuff. And the key to any kind of web, or any kind of publishing operation, is you've got to keep the costs low so that you can stay profitable. And I mean, Absolutely. they had more stuff than we do, and you know, we yeah. still managed to turn a profit on this one. So. There was a lot of spend going on and not a lot of return coming in. I don't understand That's quite fair. why they screwed it up. What about the so, uh, the uh, uh, kind of some people were saying? Well, it shows you that it, the, it's not the brand, the journalist brand by itself is not that valuable. That Mossberg minus the Wall Street Journal is not as valuable. That David Pogue minus the New York Times is not right. as valuable. Is that That's certainly Bob Lefsetz, You know, had a newsletter post in which he talked about that. Uh, Dan Lyons. Um, Lyons was the one who said Steve that. Jobs yeah, said on, the same on Facebook, thing. yeah. Um, they were both basically making the same point, which is it's not enough to just be a star. You have to be associated with a big entity in some way. Um, you know, Bob compared it to uh, musicians try and go out on their own and do their own albums, and it's just a lot of work. And so I, th I think you can do it. I mean, there's certainly examples of people who have done it. John Gruber is a great example of someone who's been able to, but he's to make that one work guy. on his own. Well, that's right. the, that's the guy, example that's there. Yeah. So that's that's the problem. Right? Yeah. A single he, guy, even Andrew Sullivan, you could argue. Um, he didn't make it. He shut brand. up. He, he shut but, down. But, but he also, he had eight or nine or 10 people. Yeah. Um, that's a, a large amount of costs. Um, if it had been him and, you know, one other person, uh, ben Thompson, who does Stratechery, runs the whole thing from his house um, in Taipei. And so for him, getting 3,000 people to pay $100 a year, boom, he's, you know, that's a great business for him. Um, but it, that wasn't what Walt and Kara were trying to do. They were trying to build, and it isn't what Gigaon was trying to do, rightly or wrongly. They were trying to build something large. And in order to build something large, that game has changed a lot. Like you have to be larger than large. You know, BuzzFeed's getting 200 million page views or, or unique visitors or something. That's not a game that you can play without a lot of money. No, I, I really feel it falls, it starts falling into two camps where previously, if you wanted to have a big website and you wanted to have a lot of, a lot of uh, following and a lot of page views, you would throw a little bit of money at it. You would get a couple of, you know, crack talent and then just keep on shoving people into the machine and being like, all right, the more content we turn out, the more page views we're going to get. Right? Right. Um, and it used to be that, that web companies didn't feel like they had to pay that much money for it. And now that the web has become more competitive, they, they see that and they're like, oh, well, if we're going to launch a new website, we need to pour in millions and millions of dollars to make sure that we launch, uh, think about the daily is a great example of this. The daily launched with a, you know, with two offices and a bunch of staff and a huge video team. And they, they launched huge at scale. And, and Rupert Murdoch's and, money. Yeah, and mm -hmm. well, but exactly. They they launched with they 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 launched with Murdoch's backing. They hired a hundred million dollars. And one year later, yeah, 
or went toast? Well, because oh. ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I feel like the model of throwing a bunch of money at the wall and then just being like with a hundred monkeys typing and a hundred typewriters, we will have internet gold. <laughs> it doesn't quite work like that anymore. It That's really right. doesn't. You know? I, I, I've started this discussion with the word voices. Unique, per, strong personal right. voices seem very important. But the structure of and journalism think, yeah. doesn't, to, sorry, the structure of journalism doesn't really, doesn't really benefit that as much as it used to. Back in the old days of print, if you got an exclusive, the only place you could read it was on your newspaper yeah, or on your site true. the next day. Right now, when Recode or when Gigarom or anyone else breaks a big story, yeah, you'll get the highly cited tag that no one reads on the Google News rankings that brings in, <laughs> you know, a quarter of your readership. But at the same time, everyone and his dog will write a quick pricey. If you're lucky, they'll link into you. So there's no real benefit, you know, and it's just the journalism which gets in the hits. And the actual, and I think that's, mm. I think that's why the hardest model of all is to do news, even if it is tech <laughs> news or even if it's something else news. It's going to be out there. Is your version a, of that news it, going to be really dramatic? It's a commodity, different? is what you're saying. Right, yeah. it's a commoditized so the, product. What does seem to work, and certainly what worked for Andrew Sullivan, raised you know almost a million dollars. Um, ben Thompson and Stratechery can seem to be able to make this work. It's analysis. Ben is not doing news. Right? He's telling people what to think about all the news that has been flowing over them for the past, whatever, right. 24, 48 hours. Right. What is important? What matters? This is an analogous, actually, picture? to a transition that happened when the Internet happened. You know, 20 years ago, the fact became devalued. Right. In pre-Internet, going to the library and ascertaining a fact took some labor. And, ha and that gave that fact some value. What did we teach kids in school? To memorize facts. There was some value. It's completely devalued now. If you want to know when somebody was born, it's three seconds away, thanks to Google. Right. But what is not what has not become devalued, in fact, what has gained value in the devaluation of the fact is curation, uh, analysis, context, all of the things that a human brain can add to fact. Uh, and that's so this is just a special example of that. Right. And I think it's also, mm -hmm. it's not just... Like you said, the voices. It's not just, it's its trust. I think that's, uh, Craig Newmark says trust is the new black. And I think in a lot of ways he's right. The It's not, you can get any amount of information you want about anything more than you could ever want so quickly. Yeah. You want someone that you trust to say, don't pay attention to any of that. Right. Pay attention to this. That's or kind this of, is the important thing. Or that this was someone reliable. That yeah. was the insight exactly. that created Twit 10 years ago was, uh, well, I'm not going to get in the business of reporting because that's commoditized. And what am I going to do that's going to be any different than tw than 100 better reporters on the ground in Silicon Valley? But what we can add is trustworthy analysis and understanding and context. And and I have to say, personality is a very big part of that, too. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, sure it is. I mean, publications can differentiate themselves on a news perspective in the way they approach the news, certainly. I mean, if you want sort of a straight read, go to AP. If you want right. something with, with a bit of character, go somewhere else. As long as the basic facts are right and the ba you know and the approach is right, that's fine. I mean, but what worried me? I mean, less worried about Recode. I was more worried about Gigaron because you had a bunch mm -hmm. of really good journalists there. You, you guys are too smart. And, yeah, and it just for some reason it didn't work, and they pulled the funding out well, of it. it was well, and I would say, and I would say, if there was a mistake, and I don't, you know, I wasn't involved in the business side. I didn't. I don't have the details about th those aspects. What, what it feels like to me is that Kigom tried to get too big too quickly, and that sort that opened up a gap, obviously a financial gap. Um, and I I don't feel like Recode was there, but I think they certainly could have gotten there if you want to be a certain size or you're trying to get to a certain size, but that doesn't match up with what you're bringing in. Eventually, you're just gonna you know you're gonna run out of rope. Um, You're going to burn, and that's, yeah. Yeah. I think no, that's kind I, of... A, oh, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, I mean, we ran into the same thing at IDG with Macworld and Tech Hive and, mm -hmm. and PC World, where it's just at a certain point, you can't... you. You can't run old media business on new media. You can't say, I want a staff of 40 to 100 reporters right. who are full-time with benefits and everything else, which is not to say that people shouldn't be full-time, but that you figure out okay, how many full-time people can we make, can we reasonably pay and do excellent reporting who are all smart, wonderful, you know, talented right. people? Now let's let's run the site with the bare minimum of that 
running reasonable hours, see what we can do. And then when there is improvement, build upon that. The problem is, is that the big companies or the companies that are used to, you know, are used to old media, are you, you know, companies like IDG, for example, they look at, oh, well, you know, the news, like in order for us to get page views quickly so that we can pay off our advertising and all of that, we need all of the content. In order to have all of the content, we need writers. And in order to have writers, we have to have a huge staff and we need to make sure that everybody's talking to each other. So we're going to get a big office and it has to be in New York or San Francisco Mm -hmm. because that's where all the news is. And it's like, this is the internet. This is the age Mm. of instant communication. You don't need to be in San Francisco or New York anymore. It helps. That's a great point. And I think... And I think for entities like the New York Times or the Washington Post or or any sort of large magazine or I mean, Jesus, fourteen Fortune and Time Inc. are facing the same problem. You there's this feeling that you have to figure out how to support the cost base that you have. So we have all these reporters and we have all these offices and we have all this stuff. We need to find out a way to pay for that digitally. But that's the wrong way of looking at the problem. You 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 can't find a way to support that old cost structure because the model you used, print advertising, is going away. And the and what's replacing it is is ten times smaller. You know, it's an order of magnitude smaller. So you can't just say, well, we need to find a way to replace you have to rethink the whole way you do what you do and the whole structure that you've built up over time because it's not it doesn't make financial sense anymore yeah it makes me feel damn lucky that's all i can say i don't (laughs) don't know how we're surviving (laughs) well i think with a digital publication everyone has to do everyone has to work you can't afford to have large accounts departments or human resources departments everyone's got to either write sell manage or edit yeah and it's as simple as that you have to be you have to be very focused about what you want to do right you can't just say well we just we want to be a really great site with lots of news about stuff like i think you just have to be very very, yeah you have to be very very focused because the days of sort of a mass media entity where and you went to that entity to get everything from sports to business to to gardening columns to comics to whatever that's just gone and it's not going to come back it doesn't matter how good you are and so google ruined it yeah google ruins everything (laughs) that's the damn it Damn it, that's the plot line Google. of this show. <laughs> no, no, it's entirely true, though. You know, uh, what Matthew well, is saying is, inter- is 100% correct. You know what, correct. if there weren't Google, somebody else would have come along. But oh, the, absolutely. It was the internet that ruined just, everything. Right, and the internet removes inefficiency. Yeah. And you know what? Human beings are Damn it, hugely efficient. inefficient. Yeah. So how do you make things more efficient? You remove the human beings. And so if you can remove human beings from your... By the way, that's what's happened to GigaOM. Don't you think they've removed the humans? And now the brand was bought by Knowingly, which is what they call a demand media company, which basically is... a polite term for it. ...machine-generated stories that are clickbait. That's kind of removing the humans, isn't it? It is a little bit. And I think there's... You know what? I have... Even when I wrote about demand media, I I thought it made a lot of sense. Their model... I don't want to do it. They're gaming the internet. They're doing exactly... Sure they are. So what you do with demand media is you look and see what search terms get a lot of results. You could do this automatically. Then you buy or generate cheap 500-word articles. Let's say people are searching for Elvis belt buckles. Well, you just make damn sure you have an article about Elvis belt buckles. However stupid, tawdry, poorly written doesn't matter Mm -hmm. because you put ads on that page and you will get links. That's demand media. and you know what? Yeah, I would you just also- say that that model, that model is not that different from what some websites are doing. Going <laughs> it's to not that Twitter different than BuzzFeed, Vice, and all the others, the really. Email, right, you at it. Huffing and Post about. invented that. Write it quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, and that's one model, right? If you if you want to try and make the internet work for you, that is one model. Sure it it's is. not for everyone. Uh, it's certainly not for me. But that is one way to approach it. The other way is to just go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum, yeah. which is to be as as targeted as you can yeah. on a specific user base or community that you connect with. And that's one that's thing. That's what Twit does. We're that, made with humans. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, flatter you unnecessarily. But I think Twit does a great job of doing that, connecting with readers who, and users and viewers who care about specific things and telling them. The things they want to know, yeah. and and having a back and forth with them, yeah. that can, that is community. very very difficult re- to replace. Yeah, and you can't do that with an algorithm. It just doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work no. without humans. 
algorithms are also dependent when we talk about the age of sort of the disconnected web where everybody's going to to places for different things google and duckduckgo and yahoo and any any search engine is a major component of that and i mean you saw demand uh, we saw demand take a huge dump a couple years back when google basically decided change oh we're going algorithm. to yeah, yeah we're going to yeah. change our algorithm and talk we're going to power. completely mess up everything talk about exactly. power and Absolutely. that's the facebook risk too right you hook yeah. your wagon to Facebook, yeah. and they're your best pal, and then they decide they actually want to target some other kind of content, and then your content disappears, yeah. you know, and you're left holding the bag. It seems like yeah, this is it's, it's a devil's bargain, I think. It's historically inevitable. It, it, humans are great at... Uh, there's always going to be a 10% a of humans who just whose only real interest is making money, who mm -hmm. figure out how I can game a system, whether it's tulip bulbs or the internet or whatever. How can I game that system, make a ton of money, I don't really care, you know, about the product I'm making. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there's always the other, the other 10, mostly the people in the middle, but there's these the other 10% that is doing this kind of handcrafted artisanal media where <laughs> they, we don't really care about the money. We care about creating the best possible product. Um, and I think that was one thing. I'm actually kind of sad that Andrew Sullivan um, quit because I think he did show mm -hmm. that you can do it. It was working. You know, the Daily Dish yeah. was making a million dollars. That's not an insignificant amount no, of money. For one person, that's great. Or two people, that's and great. And I mean, he felt burnt out and so on. But I, th I still think he was doing exactly the same thing. I wrote a column about him and Amanda Palmer, um, who was kickstartering, yeah. you know, a record. And I, w and I was saying, fundamentally, they're doing the same thing. One is doing it with music and right. one is doing it with, you know... Um, what Andrew was doing, opinion, but the, both of them were connecting with a community of readers and listeners, and and that's all they cared about, right? You no, know, it probably happened. I don't know, but I would guess that Andrew made enough money that he could stop, you know. Yeah. And then he said, "Good, I got a pile of money here. I'm tired. I want to do something else." And he just stopped. And that's one thing that does happen. That's very different if you're not a big business and you're not building, you know, a uh, a legacy. Mm. You just stop. I am done. And I will say, I don't know what Karen I don't know and what, Waltz, yeah. what their motivations yeah. were, but it is hard work doing what they've oh, yeah. tried to do Filing since everything. all things D yep. started. Yep. That stuff is really, really hard, especially when you're a small company. Yeah. And I certainly don't blame them for deciding oh, not they would all. like someone else to do all not of that all. hard work and yeah. they can just go back to doing what they do. Do you think, uh, now the rumor was that uh, Comcast, which is an investor in both Vox, the purchaser, <laughs> mm -hmm. and Recode, the seller, pushed them together in order to later devour them both. Well, it, it certainly seems plausible to me. I mean, Comcast has talked about, at least reportedly, has talked to Vox about acquiring the whole Is this thing. what happens is uh, is there's this just consolidation of the media. It, it, it seems to happen in every business at every time. It's that you, get the, you get something new, an innovation like the internet, which creates an environment in which many minnows can blossom and then a bigger fish came and ate all the minnows and a bigger fish ate that one and a bigger fish ate that one and ultimately consolidates back to the way it was and occasionally one of the big fish chokes on its own food and, and <laughs> dies and everyone eats the remains and the whole thing cycles around again yeah. yes but the i mean circle <laughs> of life. yeah try and disneyfy that one to kids but i gotta say i I'm worried by the, the thought of Comcast taking that over. I'm equally oh, worried God, by yes. Verizon's uh, Verizon's investments in the media field. Yep. Particularly as Verizon apparently tried to set up a magazine last year which said mm -hmm. you can write about anything apart from net neutrality and, yeah. and government snooping. Yeah. So, you know, okay. it's tricky. You know, I, I don't trust Comcast further than I can throw them, but I say give them the benefit of the doubt so far. This, and we'll have to ask our, our historian of journalism, Jeff Jarvis, at some point, but this sounds like uh, the history of media for 200 years um i mean i don't think that uh, the hearst empire was in any way pure or oh, and totally objective. partisan as well no, totally at partisan not, a, not at all they, sure. you know so this is not uh, nothing new and it's and it's interesting to think about um you know i work for a unit of time inc now time inc was based on a magazine that henry booth Right. Lou started when he was in his 20s, I'm pretty right. sure. He started it with much the same attitude that mm -hmm. BuzzFeed started with. Mm -hmm. He aggregated the heck out of everything. Mm -hmm. He took stories from other people and rewrote them so that they were funny or shorter or whatever. And then he built this giant media empire that now is the thing that everyone else is trying to destabilize. I mean, there are 
patterns that repeat themselves. Isn't that interesting how that happens? We're going to take a break. We're going to pack. Well, I do want to talk a little bit. We, we, you saw a picture of the, uh, uh, the Google um, uh, giant 16 camera virtual reality array. We heard a lot about cardboard. I want to talk a little bit about it. Get back to the shiny stuff in uh, just a second. Um, but, uh, you know, I, what I love is having a panel of smart people and we can talk. And this is one thing you can't do on mainstream media. No. For 15, 20 minutes on a completely philosophical subject that no one cares about. That's twit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've got enough people watching at the moment that somebody cares. That's <laughs> our mission statement. We talk about uh, obsessively about stuff you couldn't care less about. <laughs> our show today brought to you by Dropbox for Business. If you're in business, you know your employees are using Dropbox. We did a little survey. It was so funny. Everybody in the office is using their personal Dropbox account to share stuff, to work together, to collaborate, which is great. I'm not knocking it. They love Dropbox. It works great for them. But I was thrilled when we could sign up for Dropbox for Business and kind of get that all consolidated. It's the same experience, the same UI. Our employees already love. We don't have to train them. We don't have to persuade them to use it. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, great. And they each get a terabyte of data. So they go, oh, you know, I don't have to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, but as the employer, you control it. The IT professionals have admin controls like remote wipe. Somebody leaves the company. They don't leave with all your goodies. Um, I saw that, uh, who was it was uh, suing? Um, was it, uh, it was a uh, jawbone suing oh, uh, Fitbit. Fitbit, yeah. Fitbit because yeah. Fitbit was hiring away employees and they'd say, Hey, before you leave, could you just put a thumb drive in the computer and download all the data, bring along with you? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. No problem. Uh, they like wearing orange if they're doing that. Yes. <laughs> so this is beautiful. You, you have control remote wipe. You'd get great sharing and permission controls, complete audit logs. You know that the people, only the right people are getting that sensitive company information. So your employees are happy. You're happy. And, of course, it integrates with third-party security and admin solutions, SIE, MDLP, eDiscovery. And they know that you really want stuff to be private. So, of course, Dropbox for Business uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Uh, and there are additional security features like single sign-on and two-step verification, all of which mean this is a solution you will love. Four million businesses are now converting from those personal Dropbox accounts to Dropbox for Business. We did, and I highly recommend you give it a try. Take advantage of what your employees already know and love. They, they love Dropbox. Who doesn't? Sign up for Dropbox for Business. Dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. Dropbox. For business, dropbox.com slash twit. We thank them uh, so much for their support. So um, what is the name of this? I want this camera. Jump. Uh, jump. It's the jump, yeah. You just got to mm. jump. Um, they should have David Lee Roth come out and say. <laughs> oh, go I'm please just saying. <laughs> no, please. At least at the after party. In a, you know, a loincloth chaps. He can't even jump chaps. himself anymore, for goodness sake. <laughs> you got to <laughs> jump. <laughs> jump, everybody. So... Um, this is 16 GoPro. Well, they're going to, first of all, they're going to publish a model for this uh, so that anybody can, uh, uh, open source plans, right? So anybody can build yep. this. Uh, there are, Dropbox says we'll sell one, which I figured if you got 16 Dropboxes, we're talking six or seven GoPro. grand. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what did I say? Dropbox. GoPro, <laughs> obviously. Six or seven grand. Um, but, you know, that's not a lot. Well, no, and they said you can actually build the array for it. But I'm going to build one. Board, they yeah. did it. You know, well, I, mean, I was talking. Cardboard obsessed, but they, you know, they do love it. It's, and it's awesome. Cheap. And YouTube supports it, mm -hmm. right? So you'll be able to record these videos. You'll even be able to do it live. So here's my pledge to you. As soon as we can, we're going to build one of these suckers, and we're going to put it in the studio so that you can wear your Gear VR, your cardboard. Uh, I don't think it's how most people will watch the show, but you might watch live that way. Yeah. If you can look around, it'll be like being in, in the studio, mm -hmm. except without the great free prizes. So, but other. <laughs> well, also means the bottle of whis whiskey I've got stashed down there is going to show up. What? So, no, it's just... <laughs> I really, this is some, this is just coolness, funness that I don't see any value to Google for. But uh, maybe Actually, this is the next big thing on YouTube. I, I think there know. is a, a considerable amount of value for it because. 
they can use the stuff like this for both virtual reality and augmented reality systems. They don't have to tie themselves to one platform. Ah. And with the VR goggles coming out uh, so next So it's not, next it, year, Oculus Rift AR doesn't own out. the market anymore. No, right? I mean, well, yeah. that, mm. Google, I don't think, is interested, isn't interested in owning the market. What it is interested <laughs> is providing the content for it right. and making it other people right. and hosting that content so that YouTube gets even more hits and more, and more, more business. I've been skeptical on VR, but I have to say, the idea that you could especially for live, that you could be, say, at the Academy Awards and look mm -hmm. around and see, oh, that's George, I'm sitting next to George Clooney, and that would be pretty when cool. In, when I was in Italy, there was a guy who had uh, an Oculus, and they had a, a film of Cirque du Soleil, and it was, as, it was as though you were sitting on the front of the stage, and so you could turn to your left yeah. and right and see other performers in the show who were talking to you or gesturing towards you while you were watching the show. It was incredibly powerful. I mean, people would pay money to do that. We were talking, I think I we'll probably it. partner with our our neighbors here at Pixel Court, Alex Lindsay's group. But I was talking with the Pixel Court folks, and they said, here's what we want to do. Plays. <clears throat> Fictional yeah. plays. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is actually a big trend in Broadway, like Tina and Tony's wedding, where you're in an immersive environment or you're going through a house. And it's and, all around you. And right? It's all around you. But you could do this with VR. And as, I, they have to fix it so that you can tune the audio so that when you look at somebody, you hear them. Mm -hmm. louder than those people but you could be immersed surrounded by actors improving or doing a script and you could look around it'd be like being in the middle of mash or something it'd be so cool yeah is and it I the diamond age is it, say again yeah is it's it's a, neil stevenson's the diamond age yes. where um yeah where there's where there yeah. are actors Raxes that are, there, yeah, yes. yeah 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 that's oh. that's my first thought and yeah. frankly, anything that moves us closer to Neil Stevens, uh, Stevenson's universe, I'm, <laughs> I'm all in. It's always good. good. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a cynic about this. I think the first two applications to drive it are going to be computer gaming and porn. Um, gaming, oh, because people sure. will spend that amount, and then when the cost level comes down, the porn industry is going to get into it. Oculus said it's going to be $1,500 it, for the co mm -hmm. gaming computer you'd have to have, plus the Rift, when yeah. it's available That's next an year. excellent price point. That's not bad. If you're a serious gamer, nothing. Um, right. Nobody spends money like the gamers, you yeah. know. I mean, they are hardcore about having the best rigs, the best. Yeah, I, yeah. I see. There's a gamer in the back one. Chris, but would you? You would want? Yeah, Chris has my Oculus Rift. I gave him the developer uh, edition. So that's. I think that I'm a believer now in that. I was big. I was saying no augmented reality is where it's at. But I think there are immersive. There are places where an immersive experience would be great. I do think. I think augmented is going to be much more broadly. Yeah. Um, sort of desirable. I think there's going to be, there may be people like me who I can't watch a lot of Oculus Rift without feeling me too. motion sickness, yep. um, particularly things that are moving quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to reduce probably my desire to do it. But, but AR, for sure, like I would buy Google Glasses that would tell me all the things that are around me as I'm wandering around a new city, for sure. Well, that's yeah. the thing. You can wander around in an, a in an AR rig, whereas you can't wander around in, right. in a virtual exactly. No, it's yeah. very, it's stationary. And I yeah. think there are two And let's face it, you have a ski mask on your face. You know? <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, like, you're exactly. You're not going to go anywhere ridiculous. with a ski mask on your face. It absolutely looks ridiculous. But again, there are, there are useful applications. I think actually a big sort of unexplored one is teaching and remote mm -hmm. remote learning Definitely. where i mean you look at how colleges are getting more and more expensive and you look at the sheer number of online classes being available just imagine someone putting one of these rigs you know in the back of their classroom or even in the middle oh, of their classroom and then all of a surgery. sudden yeah imagine oh medical, my gosh you know training oh you yeah but, mm -hmm. a, i just operator. read an article uh, uh I, it was on Sophos or one of the security blogs about apparently the telesurgery software they're using is hackable. A man in the middle, of, you could do a man in the middle attack and take over a surgery. This scares me a little bit. Should scare you As a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how widespread telesurgery is, but let's lock that down, shall we? Yeah, particularly where vasectomies are involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google but also has see. Project Soli. This was uh, interesting. Um, this was the it was this was like radar or something that sees so they show it as an example you can turn your fingers like you're twisting a knob and an actual virtual knob will twist did you play with this uh, jason jason how was at google io yeah i did did it do what did it kind of live up to the promise i would say i mean you know based on the examples that they had set up on the floor it was interesting it was hard to get a sense of how accurate uh, things were when i was playing around with it but I mean, it was obvious that it was doing what it what it promised in the sense that you know 
things moved when you were moving your fingers and well, this you would kind go, of and this do would go different motions VR, and create right? a wave and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Even Reach for out. scrolling. Yeah. yeah. You know, even for swiping, like minority report style. Right. You know, swiping through pages that you're looking at on a heads-up display. Yeah, I mean, the demo was really, really impressive, but Google's really good at doing impressive <laughs> demos, yeah. and particularly the attack. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, no I would, question. Yeah, I mean, it's just they were talking about the, you know, their, their, their Tango mobile phone. And it's been going, they've been talking about it for two years now and show me the damn hardware. Yeah. I mean, this looked great, but show me working in a consumer sense that my mother can use, I'm sold. But until then, we'll see. Yeah. I actually saw an article about the guy who developed the, um, the UI uh, in Minority Report and also did some consulting for Iron Man, the sort of, you know, heads up display, screens moving around. Um, he's designing real interfaces now. Uh, so presumably we'll see lots of that type of stuff come to market. It's exhausting. I'm going <laughs> to like this all day. I don't want to do that all day. Yes. Yeah, but... That's why I like, the, I like Google because you just do a little thing like that. Well, I wonder, I, I wonder how much or how little gestures will, especially frontwards gestures. I have mm -hmm. to wonder if it's not necessarily maybe something that, like a glove or something where you put mm. on with your hands where you can have them in your lap. And you just, you know, it's almost like mm -hmm. you're typing. But I want to, like, no. Do you remember Bewitched? I want to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, 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 do. Just with your nose. I could use that for the Apple Watch, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There have been times where I'm like, I want to scroll this, but I do not want, yeah. I don't want to use a secondary hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can't just say Siri scroll. <laughs> well, Google showed off the, with the Android Wear thing. They showed a uh, wrist movement where you go, where you flick yeah. your wrist like that. And you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can do that yes. on a, one, of, yeah, one of our readers came yeah. in and said, said, I've been trying this and my wrist has, hasn't been this sore since I was a teenager. <laughs> well, I mean. don't do it a lot. Uh, oh, boy. It's uh, not that hard. You can just go no. like that. It's not, you don't have to like make a big jerk out of yourself. It's just, <laughs> uh, this is uh, the Urbane. All the LG watches got 5.1. Even the original LG watch, which they shipped at Google I.O. Oh, uh, the Game Google. Yes. And uh, exactly. last year. And, uh, you know, I have to say I have an Apple watch, but I, th partly because I don't want to have to use an iPhone. Uh, I really, I think Android Wear is pretty nice. Everybody mocks me for this watch. Saying it's ugly. I really like Android Wear. I Looks just said that there's, yeah, that unfortunately, uh, I have a, I tried on the Urbane a couple weeks back when I was yeah. hanging out with the, the my Android it's pretty Central big. colleagues. You probably couldn't wear it. No, the, every yeah. single Android Wear watch is yeah. like this around me. I wrote yeah. an article about this where I'm like, unfortunately, I actually like a lot of things about Android Wear. I think it's actually doing some really smart things and wearables. And I'm I'm excited for the way that the Apple Watch and Android Wear are going to kind of push each other f up forward. But I'm waiting for Android Wear to actually have sizes that are wearable by women mm -hmm. or by men with small wrists. Because right now, even the smallest available um, does not even remotely fit my wrist. Like this is the 38 millimeter Apple Watch. And even that one is just you know, just barely the right size. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's my wrist and it's like, that's 38, 42, the Moto 360 and the Urbane. And that's going up my wrist. But if you scroll down, there's actually, there's the Urbane on my wrist. Did you say my wrist hasn't been that, that sore since that I was bad. a teenager? Yeah, one of our readers. It just that, sucked yes. in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm very funny. slow. Too much of a clean that mind. It took me like eight minutes to get that joke. <laughs> but I, I can sympathize with you, Serenity. I've got fairly slim wrists as well. And I tried that original LG and it was just like, it was like having a brick on your wrist. I just I'm think it's yeah. about time computer industry recognized that most of its users are overweight. And uh, it's, you know, screw you, thin people. I'm still not sold on the smartwatch <laughs> as a mass consumer item, but they, they, they are, they are No, they're not a mass consumer item, although yeah. Apple seems to be selling 30000 a week, which well, makes it yeah, a pretty I mean, good consumer yeah. item. Yeah, but once the fanboys run out of cash and the people, ta <laughs> people who are taking a slightly more reasonable approach in this... Look yeah. at it and go, sold yeah. that for a game of soldiers. Then you're going to How get... many Apple Watches in the know. audience? Two? Okay, how many other smartwatches? How many other audience? smartwatches? Two? Ah, nice. How many people are not wearing a watch at all? Most? Mm -hmm. And then one guy's got a Timex. <laughs> or is that a fancy watch there? It's pretty. Fa it's a fancy watch. You like, saw how he looked at it. <laughs> he doesn't want to get rip robbed by the guy behind him. Uh, <laughs> I feel bad for the lady... Who dropped off an Apple One at the recycling center? <laughs> a two hundred thousand dollar Apple One at the recycling center. They're looking for you. 
Yeah, but all good to them, they were honest recycling. about it. That, uh, that, that article makes me really sad, though, uh, because it, from the from the sounds of it, she dropped it off because her husband died prematurely. <sighs> she and had she no just idea. Wanted to, she wanted part. to excavate yeah. this. I mean, I, I can totally see, you know, I could see, my, like, God forbid, my father died. I could see my mother just being like, nope, it's all going away because I don't want to look at it because it's going to hurt too much. And I don't think she actually, you know, she probably didn't even think about it. It was just like, oh, these were his things. These were the things that, you know, he loved. And I, I just can't wow. look at it right now. Well, it's a serious kudos to Clean Bay Area because they mm -hmm. found it and sold it for $200,000. Yeah. This is not some made-up number. They actually sold it to a collector for $200,000. They want to give her a check for half. Uh, which is actually, I think, very generous. Finders, I think it's incredibly keepers, generous. Very much, reapers, yeah. But I mean, you think all it took was one impl one rogue employee to say, oh, right, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. No, that's obviously useless. Yeah. I'll take yeah. that away. And, oh, I'm off to the Bahamas for the next two weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very honest of them. More power to them. Pat on the back to clean Bay Area. And if you ever want to give away, you know, something that's really, really valuable, just give it to them and they'll sell it and send you <laughs> half. Um, I'm sure we have an Apple one in the basement somewhere. We have everything else. <laughs> Do we, John? Come on. <laughs> Don't give up. We can you make sold one. sold it already. <laughs> we, got so, we have so many old junky things there. I still can't bear to throw away my old ZX81, even though it's... That's a great computer. Did you is. build it yourself? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that we bought the we bought the pre-made version. Uh, but ZX81 was so many people's introduction. It was a kit, right? Originally, or uh, no? you could buy it over here as a kit. Yeah. In the UK, they sold it as a as a base unit because Timex sold it over Timex here. Timex here sold here. It was uh, Acorn, was it? Uh, or uh, no, that was the BBC model micro. Yeah. No, this was uh, Sinclair and Sinclair. Street. That's right. And he had Sinclair. This, right. Yeah, he had this idea that. Oh, you don't need anything like a, a, an instruction manual. Just give them a book of basic. People want to learn how to program in basic, and <laughs> we were forced to. So you know, it's, um, that was that was a great computer. I'm jealous that you had one, and I'd love to have one uh, if you ever. It's in a storage unit back at home at the moment. If you I'm die, afraid. tell your wife. Bring it here, and uh, I'll take it. Uh huh. Um, okay. Yeah, we have some boxes. Um, yeah, look at that. Manufactured in Scotland. Yeah. That worst, makes it really worst great. Worst keyboard I've ever used. Well, it was just a membrane, uh, right? It was, yeah. you know. And without the 16K battery pack, uh, <clears throat> RAM pack, a very limited use, but it was, yeah, 50 They 50, sold a million and a half. It was 50 quid. You know, That's you how many iWatches are sold every month. Yeah. I mean, it was 50, 50 pounds. You couldn't buy a Chromebook for that these yeah. days. But uh, as I say, you did have to learn basic to use it, so... Mixed blessing. You stored stuff via an external tape, cassette tape. Ah, oh, yeah. You try and tell young people today that you used to do <laughs> Kids fiddle around today. with a tone control, but trying to get the program on board. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounded like. Made piracy really easy, apparently. Mm. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. sometimes you never did I've it heard. yourself. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't know. 1981. So, oh, no. yeah, that's. I, I got my first computer a couple of years before that. But I remember when these came out. These were really awesome. I had an Atari 1040. Oh, good bit yeah. of kit. I had Atari 400 as my first computer, membrane keyboard also. I got tired of banging on that, so I got the 800, which had a real keyboard. <laughs> you know what kids... T so, okay, that's kids what... Today. that Kids today have little bits. <laughs> Look at this. I am so jealous. Kids today, <laughs> you got it made. Little Bits uh, makes these incredibly easy-to-use electronics kits with modular building blocks. You can get uh, your dog to text... Or make a robotic snack server. Modules range from very simple, like uh, power sensors and LEDs. And what's great about this, to the very complex programmable units. And so far, there are now already over 60 modules. And what's great, there's no soldering. They just snap together like magnets. And they do all sorts of cool stuff. This is the kit I have here is the deluxe kit. That's 18 modules, five, uh, 5 million circuit combinations. There's 15 projects in the box. They have really good documentation will help you put that all together. This is the new one, though. I really... Oh, man. If you're uh, you know, a parent and you're trying to get your kid interested in a technology, but you want them to understand how it works, this is so great. The base and the deluxe kit's a great way for getting kids started. This is the space kit. Developed... What? Yes. Developed in partnership with NASA. Uh, you can do Earth and space science... Uh, I, you know, this, I mean, God, this, kids today are spoiled. They're so lucky. Well, <laughs> for a while I felt bad because we they, we had chemistry sets. Yeah. So we could blow stuff up. But this is the new chemistry set. They have an Arduino coding kit, introduces kids to programming. Uh, there's a synth kit for musicians. 
which includes a modular analog synthesizer. Every uh, Little Bits kit comes with these this great manual, which really makes it fun and easy for uh, kids to do it. You know, because the truth is, you know, if you get this as a parent, mm. you're going to have to figure it out. Yeah. So believe me, you will not be frustrated. I actually built, what did I build? A little tickler. A little kitty, a little um, kitty tickler. Oh, okay. Kitty for my kitty cat. Had a little, Got it. Had a feather that went over. What did you? What were you thinking? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Like nothing at nothing all. Nothing at all. Does it mean <laughs> something different in Great Britain? I'm sure it does. <clears throat> um, so you get a buzzer, a light wire, RGB servo motors. That's what I had the kitty tickler on. A buzzer, uh, inverter. Oh, oh, you learn logic too, right? Logic gates. Here's mm -hmm. a latch, an inverter, a fork. Oh man, this is so cool. There's a tickle machine. See, you didn't believe me. Oh, look. Remember when you went in the back of the magazine, you get a buzzer for a handshake? Well, now you can make an actual buzzer with real electricity. Kids. Oh, great, because that's something we really want to make happen again. You know? Here's an auto greeter. It, it waves. A hand. Why, why spend energy waving your hand as you pass through the rabble? You could it's use the auto much. trunk crane. and Oh, I love little bits. They're just getting better and better and better. We want you to give it a try. They're offering new customers $20 off their first kit when you go to Little Bits. L -I, not Lil Bits. I know I say it that way, but it's Little Bits. L-I-T-T-L-E bits.com slash twit. And free shipping in the United States. Little Bits. I love these guys. Little Bits.com slash twit. Making kids' lives a little bit better. They're so delightful. Bits. <laughs> Aren't they cool delightful? Stuff. Matthew yeah, Ingram, well, go ahead. Serenity. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I don't know if anyone else saw that Marvel's doing a contest for, for girls, I think 14 to 17, who are making micro, like make a micro architecture project. And then you submit it in for Ant-Man and like the, you have the potential yes. to go meet Imagineers. And then you also get to teach uh, people your age how to build that project in a local area school. And I was just thinking about that. I'm like, that would actually be a really good pairing. It's like, get get your kid a yeah. little bit set and then, you know, see if they want to do this contest. It's just, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I think that's really, really cool that we're encouraging kids and, and young girls to do I to agree. do micro Definitely. micro building. I'm, Definitely. I'm starting to get bullish on this idea that maybe there will actually be women involved in technology in the in some day, in some distant future, there'll actually be women involved in this. And you know, we're making such an effort at this point, they might even be in the majority. And is is there any person at all who thinks that's a bad idea? Nope. That's a great idea. Sold on that. The first I'm software programmer was a woman, Grace Hopper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the history Susan of IT Kerr. is littered with great women. Susan Care, we love Susan. Mm -hmm. She's great. Did the icons for the original Mac. I know, Matthew Ingram, you got to get out of here. It is so mm -hmm. great to have you always on the show. Any thought? I'd mentioned that uh, Ross Ulbricht, life without parole for creating the Silk Road. Is that, yeah, I, that seems like... That a, just seems outrageous to me. I mean, I know he did lots of bad things. I read a a horrifying discussion he had with someone about, you know, putting a hit on a couple of people. That's yeah, but he wanted to pay in Bitcoin. So how serious could he have been? <laughs> so obviously that's not the kind of thing we yeah. want to encourage, but it feels to me as though he's being asked to pay the price for a whole bunch of other people who did things. He just did the back platform. end, right? Right. He basically built a platform. So it's a little like trying to go after Craig Newmark because right. somebody hired a hitman on Craigslist. Right. That's what it feels like to me. An example is being made of him, certainly. I mean, mm -hmm. life without parole is just, it's ridiculous. I mean, if you look it's at the sentences which are carried out, handed out for fraud or oh, that sort of thing, which hurt many more people. Um, but of course, so many of the people who run our banks, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, those guys have been in jail and will be in jail forever, right? <laughs> oh, no? Sure. No? They're still running those banks? Yeah. Oh. Never, yeah. Never slap mind. On the, slap on the wrist time. Never but, mind. Uh, I mean, if you read yeah. the judges summing up, it was... Utterly partisan. The minimum he could have given him was 20 years. Uh, there were 197 letters in his behalf from friends and family saying, give him, we understand he's going to serve time, he's going to do 20 years, give him the minimum. They gave him instead life without parole uh, and a $184 million fine. I think, you know, working for cigarettes, it's going to be a little hard for him to pay that off. Uh, it's going to be very hard, and he's going to be a very, very old man when he gets out. Yes, I uh, think for for the actual crime that he committed, I said, yes, a crime, out of, out of, but yeah. way out of proportion. Yeah, way out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Matthew, thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks for Love having me. Love having you on Fortune.com. He's Matthew I on the Twitter. 
and he is uh, he is always just a, a, a beacon of sensible, <laughs> common sense of intelligence. It's always nice to have you on. We'll see you soon. Great. Thanks, Thanks. to uh, Ian Thompson, who is actually quite the opposite. He's uh, acidic, <laughs> acid-tongued. Uh, no, I love Ian, too. You, you, fun to read. Always smart. Thank you. You'll find him at register.co.uk. And uh, I'm glad you've been coming up here a lot. I appreciate it. I thank no, you. no, it's always good fun. I'm love just down the road, here. so fair yeah. enough. Love having you here. And if and when you that site when that when you pass away in that Sinclair, you could always you know we'll give you. A yeah, there's tax a couple deduction. of people you might have to fight oh. for it, but hey, we could put it on you know <laughs> live fight. Here's the prize. Here's a thing of wrestling oil. Go for it. Do know? I have to say ZX though? Do I have to? <sighs> I'm sorry. If you're going to own a British computer, you got to talk British. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It's the rules. I can talk British, Governor. <laughs> thank you also to, sorry about that. <laughs> thank you also to uh, the great Serenity Caldwell. Yes, yes, I know she uh, does do roller derby, but she's also a brilliant writer. And uh, you can catch her work at imore.com. She's the one who discovered the Apple Watch doesn't work uh, if you have a sleeve with a tattoo. So it, it works. It just doesn't work for very specific tattoos. You can't do the heart rate. <laughs> Yeah, well, right. I my boyfriend has a has a sleeve and it works fine. It's oh. just it's it's dark solid colors. Got so it. if you have if you have black right here, it's not going to work. When's but your next uh, when your when's your next derby match? Um, next one is in July. I just got back from a practice. What's the name it's of the What's the name great. of the uh, of the team? I skate for the Cosmonauties as part of the Boston <laughs> Derby Dames. <laughs> Uh, and also the uh, the Boston Massacre and the Boston Bee Party are our travel teams, and they ah. have a game next weekend. Nice. Thank you, Serenity. Great to have Thanks. you here. Thank you to, to everyone joining us. As you probably noticed, we're still doing live behind-the-scenes broadcasts, and I think we probably will continue that. We What we've decided to do is give every, every host the choice of whether they want to record their shows live on the uh, stream or record them off the stream and have the produced versions on the stream. Most of the hosts want to do that. I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, we are working on solutions to our chat room. Many of the mods uh, want to move on. I don't blame them. It's really been kind of a battle zone. But we are not planning on killing chat. We're just going to find uh, a way to make it a little bit easier, safer, and uh, a better experience for those people who have to keep an eye on things. We know how important our community is, and I, I, uh, I'm not willing to give it up. Not for nothing. If you want to be here, so we will be live again next week. If you want to watch, you can. 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 2200 UTC, live.twit.tv. If you'd like to be in studio, we love having you. We had a great audience uh, of people here this week. We really appreciate your being here. Just uh, e email us if you can. Tickets at twit.tv. We'll put you on the list. We'll make sure we have a chair for you. And, of course, lovely parting gifts for each and every one of you just for coming to the show. Tickets at twit.tv. Well, it's it's I know it's a rubber band, but it's it's imprinted, <laughs> right? It says Twit on it, you know. Uh, tickets at Twit.tv. If you want to watch uh, our on-demand video or audio, always available wherever you get your podcasts on our website, Twit.tv. The new website will launch between I hope between now and next show, sometime this week. So if you see a sudden change in how the website looks. Uh, thanks to Four Kitchens, the great designers and programmers there, and uh, we'll kind of give you a tour at some point, uh, how it works and all the new features uh, there. What we're really in excited about sharing with you is the new website comes with a public API, which we will publish and let you write your own stuff, uh, if you wish, so that you can uh, scrape our content. The API is very rich, lots of detail. Uh, it's what the website uses. Uh, the website is a consumer of the API. Uh, but it's also uh, what our our new apps will uh, use, and we're talking to app developers about creating apps for iOS, Android, Windows. That means Windows 10, Xbox One, and Windows Phone, uh, as well as all the other platforms. And uh, that API is going to make that, I think, a lot not only a lot easier, but a lot better. The the apps should be really, really sync. So we're excited about that. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Another twit this is in the can. Thanks. Yay.